isn't that amazing that uh, we seem to have made the impossible? Can you actually think of these people uh, not just uh, sitting at the same table with us here, right, but getting in one room? It's amazing, isn't it? I would like to give applause to our panelists for it. It's a very special occasion, and believe me, there's been a lot of effort and time and energy that, that's been put into, in, in, into making this happen. It's not something you do on an ordinary basis, on a daily basis. And thank you very much indeed uh, for having come here, and I'm very pleased to, to host you here. Okay, if I may kindly suggest uh, each and every of you, obviously, I mean, the, uh, people, people know you very well indeed, but how would you briefly introduce yourself and define, ha highlight your, your major achievements today? Can I start with Professor Ravini, please? Um, well, uh, I'm an economist. You're a communist? I an economist. <laughs> I'm an economist. <laughs> Don't say that in Great Britain. <laughs> Brock Pierce, um, a janitor, a plumber, a carpenter. Well, oh, that's very unusual already, isn't it? So I'm Bobby Lee. I got into Bitcoin in 2011. Previously, uh, co-founded and CEO of BTC China and BTCC. Now I just started my new startup this year called Ballet. We make uh, cryptocurrency physical wallets. Uh, for the for the whole world. So so far, you're the only one who's doing anything serious here. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, 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 so. yeah. I know you. You ruined it for everyone because I, you know, wrote the Satoshi white paper. I'm Tom Vase, by the way. So I have a. We have a booth in the back. Please come visit us. Ballet wallets. Craig. So, I'm the cause of all this, and I'm an eternal student. And no, I'm sorry, but uh, you didn't write it. And I'm sorry, Tone, you don't even understand it. You have this concept that you can't take cryptocurrency. This whole idea that miners vote to change protocol. The white paper doesn't say that. The last line says that miners enforce the rules. As right, an you, economist, you'll may, know what may rules are. I suggest uh, we just confine to, to a very short, and that, that was by way of introduct, uh, introducing That's, yourself. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Just let's keep it concise. Okay, we'll come to the points. Don't worry. Don't, don't jump the I've the never lights. been called concise. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, thank okay. you. Right. Now that the panelists have been introduced, uh, I'm more than happy to, to, uh, to ask some, some, some more, more funny questions, really. Now, uh, starting with you, Professor Rubini, uh, what do you think is so wrong about the, the world economy? And why should we all be so scared of the, of the upcoming recession? Uh, I know we're going off on a bit of a tangent here, because, <clears throat> but uh, presumably we have the one of the most authoritative experts in macroeconomics to date, and I would really be pleased if uh, Nouriel could share his views on this first and foremost. So why is it the scary time for the world economy? Uh, well, there are a bunch of um, tail risks in the global economy. The first one is the risk of a trade, currency, technology, and Cold War between US and China. In the last 40 years, there's been a period of uh, global integration, more trading goods, services, capital, labor, technology, data, information. We could be at the beginning of a process of what I call deglobalization or balkanization of the global economy, fragmentation, decoupling, splinternet, and that's a permanent negative supply shock. Uh, here in the UK, there is a risk of hard Brexit, that will lead to a recession, not just in the UK, but also, in my view, in the rest of Europe. Uh, there are geopolitical tensions in the Middle East. Uh, if there was a, a war between US and Iran, all would go above $100 per barrel. That will tip the global economy in a recession, like it happened after Yom Kippur War in 73, Iranian Revolution in 79, or the Iraq invasion of Kuwait in 1990. And there is broadly a broader issue. There is a, I would say, Populist backlash against trade, migration, globalization, even technological innovations becoming capital intensive, skill buyers, and labor saving. And we've seen it both in advanced economies and emerging markets. So, so there are lots of things that are potentially wrong in the global economy, in brief. Okay. Brock, do you have anything to, to add to that? Or do you think it's all good and well in the world economy? Or you're not concerned? 
Oh, no, I'm, I'm very concerned. And I, I tend to, uh, uh, I agree with Noriel 90% or more of the time. Um, I'm one of the, the, the few people in crypto that agrees with most of what he has to say. And clearly, as, a, as we look at the global economy, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, uh, the world's rather scary right now. Uh, especially, I mean, the, the China being the, the primary driver of this, you know, U.S., China, and Apparently, what yeah. can be triggered. And there's a hundred things right now that could... Uh, go wrong. Could go wrong. Mm. And, you know, it's not one thing. And so I'm very, very nervous about the sort of outlook. I'm a big advocate for gold as a result of that. You know, I'm a, a, a big advocate of, you know, cryptocurrency, which is still not ready for prime time, right? It's not ready for the average consumer. Um, but, uh, you know, I still have great hope okay. that, uh, uh, that we'll continue to innovate and make these things easier to use for, call it the average uh, consumer. But, um, you know, I'm uh, a big fan of hard assets right now. Uh, I'm not, not, a, not a fan of uh, uh, stocks, bonds. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very nervous. Uh, if I may uh, go back to 2008, allegedly the, the year which actually propagated, gave birth to, to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Uh, what, were the instru what were the tools uh, that you were using, Nouriel, that we were, when you were predicting, if I may say so, the, the financial crisis of 2008? Did it happen on the spur of the moment? I don't think it, it has. There has been some really deep, profound thinking behind it. Uh, so what is it that, how, how did you manage to figure it out back then? Well, you know, I, I spent the last 30 years of my academic career and also I did work during the Clinton White House doing policy work studying a phenomenon of financial crisis. You know, there are various aspects of them. There are currency crises, there are balance of payment crises, there are sovereign debt crises, there are corporate debt crises, there are banking crises. There can be also household debt crises or any combination of them. And usually they are uh, the result of a build-up of uh, uh, asset and credit bubble that reach then a peak point, and then there is a boom and a bubble that turns into a, a bust and a crash. So, you know, anybody who has done work either theoretically or empirically or policy about them for the last few decades uh, uh, sees them coming. You know, my good friend Nassim Taleb wrote a book about black swans and he thinks of crisis being black swan, but uh, in my book about crisis economics, I refer to them as being white swans, in, mm -hmm. in which sense uh, he thinks of it as being like an earthquake or a tornado cannot be predicted, while in my view it's more like a hurricane that is a build-up of financial, economic and policy vulnerability that eventually reach a point of a, of a crisis, so they're more predictable than stuff that is like an earthquake cannot be predicted. So, in other words, uh, predicting world financial crises is, is, is easy peasy for you. Is that correct, Nouriel? Well, <laughs> it's, it's never easy to get the timing right, but you see a build-up of vulnerabilities eventually okay. reach what people refer to as a Minsky moment. So, okay. those who have been studying them for a long time have the tools to understand why they're coming. They're not just random events. No. They're not just a so distribution that has fat tails and then something happens, like a tornado or an earthquake. It's so, in other sense, words, more like a yes. hurricane. The global economy is now rickety, to say the least. Is that well, uh, there have been financial crises, you know, every few years, both in advanced economies and okay. in emerging markets. Well, the, 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 the title of this panel that I suggested uh, runs as what are the, the flaws of the global financial system as we have it today? So it's kind of provocative, really, because there's no way that you would deny any one of you sitting here that would they would deny that, 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 there is a, that there are concerns and there are growing concerns about that and no one is going to sit pretty. So, uh, Bobby, if I were to ask you, how would you define what, what, what are the most, uh, the, the crucial flaws of the centralized global financial system as we see it today? Yeah. And then we'll start uh, perhaps discussing as to how, how we can possibly try and overcome that by, by introducing the blockchain technology and perhaps crypto, uh, but what are the major problems as you to, see to today? To put it simply, the biggest problem today is the money system that we use. Money, money is used in all parts of society, all over the world, in every economy, and the money we use today is not just in the paper form or the coin form, but also the digital money that circulates in banks and transfers and so on. That money system today is no longer asset-backed. We're using a debt-based money system that can be inflated 
and printed and increased with, without our sort of cooperation. Central banks around the world will unilaterally decide to increase the money supply in all these countries. And they do it in the name of to prevent you know, the Great Recession, the Great Depression, and so on. But the reality is by having that control, the central bankers all over the world, they have tremendous power over the people. Today, none of us here are enslaved. I don't see any shackles on any of your hands. But if I tell you that your work and your labor over the last three years and three months or the last 30 years can be arbitrarily taxed by the government where they can just take out your earnings through the use of inflation and money printing, then we might as well be working for the, for the guy, for the, for the government. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. The problem is today we're invisibly shackled to the system because our work, so we all go to work, whether it's today, tomorrow, this year, this month. If the wages for that work can be arbitrarily taken away from us without our permission as humans, as citizens of a country, then I think that's a big problem. And that's yeah. the problem with today's debt-based money system. Ted, would you substantiate that argument? Um, yeah, no, I completely agree with Bobby that the biggest problem is the easy money printing of uh, governments all around the world. And uh, Bitcoin fixes that. And, but just Bitcoin, not shit coins, not Ethereum, not other, not other cryptocurrencies, not fake Bitcoin forks, fake Bitcoins coming off of forks. Like uh, BTC. Uh, like all the, the other ones. That sort of thing. Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, uh, Bitcoin helps to fix that. And uh, uh, so that's what I'm looking forward to. Um, as far as black swans uh, that Doriel mentioned, yes, they're, they're there. And they come up, and they come up way more often than statistics are telling you that they should come up. But if your investment strategy is to invest in a black swan, I can tell you firsthand, you are going to lose all of your money. Um, you're supposed to invest in things that are trending and then hedge that. Uh, and there's lots of financial tools to hedge against black swans. Don't get over leveraged and don't you know, assume you're right. Um, so you can't uh, you can't predict the black swans. You can try. You will be wrong on your timing unless you get lucky. Uh, and you can't invest for that. Uh, but what you can do is opt out of the current financial system through Bitcoin and protect yourself in that way against those black swans. Craig, if I might kindly add something to that. So Bitcoin was really developed to look at Minsky's instability hypothesis and asymmetry in information. Bitcoin is a tracing system. One of the aspects, if you read man's idea of money, is money needs to be traceable. This is not an aspect that a lot of cypherpunks run around and, and admit. Yes. But money requires traceability. This goes right back to the 17th century, and it includes cash and all the rest. Now, the key aspects of the financial crisis that no one really talks about actually come from information asymmetry. In banks, they have a monopoly on information. They get to own our information, and they capture what we can do. So we can't easily move between banks. We can't share information between organizations. The information asymmetry extends to CDS and large swap issues. It extends to government bonds. So no one actually knows the existence of most bonds. They don't know how they're traded, consolidated, and they end up being black swans because information is difficult and expensive and can be siloed. Absolutely, so, I, I would agree with that. Even, uh, money, being, uh, money being traceable is totally ridiculous. Uh, your money should be your property. Yeah, we uh, have it a shouldn't blockchain. be traced. And, uh, Absolutely. It shouldn't it's, be traced. No one should tell you how you can spend your money or not. Which is not what tracing actually is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, we have this concept here. Tracing means people can tell us what to do. Actually, I, no. I, th I think tracing you mean by the fact that we track that there's no inflation and hidden inflation of money. Is that what you mean by tracing? No, I don't. I mean the legal term of tracing. Right. The, the legal term. So it means that the government or no, it somebody mean the with government. a single node... Uh, like on the BSV chain, can just censor your transactions? Uh, actually, you can censor anything in Bitcoin. The thing that he likes to not look at is that there are a small number of economic players that all of which can easily I do stop hope it doesn't any big fighting in this panel. <laughs> and I will give you a little prediction that I know a little bit of insight into. In 2020, 
there's going to be Bitcoin seized by government. And those miners are going to help them. Why? Because only nodes, section five of the white paper, matter. And nodes are miners. They validate blocks. The system's designed that way. Government, when we're talking proceeds of crime, if you look at Liberty Reserve, 42 countries interacted to take down a distributed system, wireless networks, etc. Billions of dollars, hundreds of banks, 15,000 nodes taken down in a day. Bitcoin, next year, there are three, and I'll say three, Phenotol dealers in China. They know the addresses of, and they have been told by people like Tone that their money is safe. Craig, if I might kind of suggest we, we stay, stay very concise here because uh, all being well tomorrow, you'll be given the chance of, of, mm. of uh, defending yourself in a, in a whopping duel, which is called, if it may remind mm -hmm. me, does Bitcoin have any value or not? And uh, Craig will be facing face-to-face, one-to-one, just like Professor Rubini will be doing so with Roger Veer uh, after the break. Um, the, he'll be taking on the strategy man, uh, Mike Beaver. Uh, I think he's sitting over there, yes. And that's going to be really, really exciting because Beaver is, is Mike is just, is just uh, very anti-crypto, but very pro-blockchain. Okay, so we have a chance of, of, of expressing your views. Any problem? I would suggest now we. No, I would suggest we now go more <laughs> as as generic as possible, without going down into these you know petty squabbles you know among the the cryptocurrencies. Let's put it that way. There is a fiat world and there is crypto world. How do you think cryptocurrencies, if at all they're on the table, might help bridge the gap really, and how they could be instrumental? in solving this, the, 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 these problems. If I may ask, Brock is ready to go. Um, so the important thing, does, does crypto, could, could that be seen as a solution? As a solution? Or it's just, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something very ephemeral and very unsubstantial that just will go and, and, and that's exactly what Professor Nouril Rubini uh, maintains. What is your take on this? Could that be a solution? Yeah, well, I mean, there's no question that, that the technology has applications for central banks and, and governments as well. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, Tether was, I was one of the founders of Tether. Tether was my idea to put a, a real world asset, you know, on the blockchain. Obviously, I've not been involved with that business since not long after its creation for liability reasons more than anything else. And unfortunately, it's not performed in the ways that I intended it to do, but it did accomplish its mission of demonstrating that there is demand for putting real world assets on the blockchain. And in the original business plan that I presented to Sequoia and others was that this is something that central banks may want to use as a technology platform for currency issuance, um, you know, as a mechanism to move money faster, uh, uh, more efficiently and more securely. And so I, I, I clearly think that this technology has applications at a government level. That's fine. Hey, can you um, comment on that? Sorry? Like, there might be demand for real-world assets on the blockchain, but to me that makes absolutely no sense uh, because having real-world assets on the blockchain actually does nothing because those real-world assets could be confiscated by the government. So if the New York District, if the New York, uh, district Attorney so uh, wins, the, wins the case, they can just call the bank and collect all of the underlying dollars of Tether. So I, don't, I see zero use case, really, for real-world assets that have the ability to be confiscated of putting them on the blockchain. It just creates more inefficiency. Uh, I agree to that. I'll, I'll give you a real example. So in China, real estate transactions are controlled by the government, buy, sell. Like all the rest, I'm sure. Like what? Like all the rest of the domains. Yeah, so, so for, imagine if you have real estate on the blockchain and you own the private key to that unit or to that allocation of real estate on the blockchain. But you having the private keys to it is meaningless because, uh, because the actual real estate could be confiscated. It could be forbidden to be transferred to someone else. So in the end, you know, when you use blockchain private keys to represent external assets, you still have that trust issue. And if you can't solve that trust issue, then it's meaningless. That's why I like Bitcoin because Bitcoin itself is not based on anything else. It's not backed by anything yeah, else. I would like to pass on the question to Professor Rubini because... Uh uh, I don't think anyone is one one sober mind would, would think that all good and well 
we're not talking about the, the overall microeconomic situation that we have, the world is having now, is facing now. I'm talking about rather the, the uh, if I go to a bank, for example, right, obviously we've got accounts and banks, I've got no idea what the bank is doing with my money, being at a, on a, at a corporate level or at a private level. I don't know, uh, uh, we, we have accounts in a, in a French French bank account, I'm, uh, I'm not going to name the, the bank, but it's one of the top five banks in the world. But even so, I've got no, I can see no traceability. I don't know who's charging my money, uh, what, what's the interest rate, what sort of uh, charges. I mean, it's all wrapped out in a shroud of mystery, let alone the fact every time one makes a transaction, it all goes through a, a process, you know, of, of transmitting the data one by one. And who can guarantee that at, throughout this journey, the data doesn't get lost or stolen, whatever. And that's a big, big challenge, I would have thought, for the financial system as we know today. Uh, would that uh, problem, do you think, could be potentially s uh, solved by using uh, cryptocurrencies? Or is absolute rubbish? Uh, oh. First of all, you know, I'm not a defender of the traditional financial system. Okay, I that's wrote good a to know. Whole, I wrote a whole book uh, uh, analyzing the role that the uh, financial system had in financial crisis, excessive leverage, excessive risk taking, not enough capital, not enough liquidity. So I'm the first critic of it. Uh, the question is, what are the solutions to it? Uh, I would say that uh, some of the inefficiencies of the financial systems are being addressed by what I call the fintech revolution. Uh, fintech revolution has pretty much nothing to do with crypto or blockchain. It's a combination of uh, AI, big data, and IoT. It's revolutionizing payment systems. It's revolutionizing credit allocation, asset management, insurance, even some of the capital market activities. Um, so, you know, with Bitcoin, you can do five transactions per second. With Visa, you can do 25,000 transactions per second. Uh, you have things in China like Alipay or WeChat Pay that billions of people use every day for billions of transactions. In uh, India, you have UPI systems. In Africa, you have M-Pesa. In US, you have Venmo, PayPal, and you name it. So there is a revolution in payment system, very low cost uh, transaction. All money is digital right now. And those things are changing. They're going to lead to a competition with traditional financial institutions. There's a lot of talk uh, within blockchain and crypto about revolutionizing financial intermediation. Uh, cryptocurrency is a misnomer. They're not a unit of account. They're not a means of payment. They're not a stable store of value. And nobody's using this kind of stuff. And by the way, conceptually, if you think about it, a world in which everything is tokenized is a world of barter, right? Because you know, for, if for every good and service I have to use a different token, I, not, I don't know what's the relative price of two goods. You know, I have to be able to have a single numerator to know the relative price of a can of Coke as opposed to a can of Pepsi. If there is a Coke coin and there is a Pepsi coin, it's chaos. It's total chaos. So people talk about tokenization, having a token for everything, is returning to Stone Age. I mean, even the Flintstones had a more sophisticated financial system than crypto. They had shell dollars, and they were using them to avoid barter, while you guys want to go back to barter. So if you know any basic monetary theory, you know that a currency has to be a numerator, has to be a single currency, you cannot have thousands of shit coins, has to be a stable store of value, has to be a means of payment scalable, has to be secure, it might be even centralized. You know, financial systems that are existing are centralized, but they are scalable and they are secure. If I lose my credit card, I call in a second, replace it, and I get my money back. If you lose your private key or someone steals it, your money is gone for good. There's no scalability. There's no decentralization. Everything is centralized in crypto. Miners are centralized. Exchanges are centralized. Developers are centralized. Wealth is centralized. You have a Gini coefficient in Bitcoin that's worse than North Korea. So, so you're professor, talking about decentralization. So, professor, so you're talking about something so assuming that doesn't is centralized. exist. You're talking so about something that doesn't exist. We don't have to get all angry about decentralization. Huh? Sounds like you're getting all worked up for this. Let me ask you a simple question. Is, for your ideal you're, currency, you're should it be asset-based or debt-based? It's not a currency, based? and it's totally centralized. Professor, should, should a currency, in your opinion, be asset-based or debt-based? And I what does that actually that mean? Every, he says asset-based or debt-based. Uh, it's a question. Gold, uh, Craig, would, would, would you mind? Yeah. Uh, so it's a simple question. question. If you don't understand the question, I can explain it, but please go ahead. To me, it's a meaning, meaningless question. Meaningless. Wow. I agree. Wow. Gold, so, hold on why second, do you hold agree, Craig? So why, why do you agree with that argument? You differentiate between 
debt that you owe, and assets you have. You think that's meaningless? A credit card, the amount of limit on your credit card. I assume you have a credit card. Are you white collar? I'm not gonna engage on this, sorry. I'm not no, but, but seriously, okay, academic question. Should currency be asset-based or debt-based? In your opinion, which is better? No, I'll, I'll, I'll do Greg, this. what do you have on this? Go, please go ahead. It's very simple. Gold-based currencies have existed. I don't understand the concept of what? And they all had debt. I don't know what money is. Concept, what money is? You have well, an asset-based currency. Who, who is no the authority on money? Is crap. Who has, do you have a PhD on That's money? The, a money has who? to be a unit of account, has to be a numerator, has to be a means of payment, has to be a stable store of value. Okay? I understand. That's so the case of right. money. Okay. My question so is, should it be about... asset-based or debt-based? How many people In my opinion, money can is buy their home without a home loan? You would have to be expecting something of a sort from How many panel, people really? buy their car without going into debt? This is probably the coolest panel I've ever seen in get crypto. a lease? <laughs> it's almost like a duel. Look, but when you have gold-based currencies, like we had in the past, they're still issued on notes, and they're still debt. This idea, debt goes away. No, it doesn't. We still want to invest. We still want to build things. We still want to get loans. We don't want to have to save. I mean, Wait. in my parents' generation, they had to save further. My grandparents had to actually get 80% of their, uh, their savings before they could get a loan of 20%. That's ridiculous. Let's go back to your question about gold-based currencies. So gold itself versus the paper money that's backed by gold, I see those as two very different things. Would you agree or disagree? What is gold? It's basically well, just a marker. Is. So this gold idea is that gold has gold, value innately, gold it Gold is doesn't. not a marker. Gold is a physical commodity. Where there has value is what people place on it. Right, so my question for you is gold versus the paper that backs a gold is two different things. Depends in my example in China, it. in holidays, mid-autumn festival, they give out mooncakes, something you can eat. That's a physical asset. And then what they do instead is they give out gift certificates, which you redeem for mooncakes. So my example I like to use in China is mooncakes, physical mooncakes that you can eat versus redeemable certificates for mooncakes. Those are two different things. One is asset, one is debt. And what's Bitcoin? I think it's an asset. I agree. It's an informational asset, but it's not being used sure. that way at the Gold moment. Gold itself is asset as well. Would you agree? Um, gold can be an asset. It is. Okay, so G generally it's used gold as an inflation back money, gold back paper money is different, right? To me, gold back paper money is the same. It was a way to scale gold for day to day transactions, and it just failed. And the reason why that failed is because the governments can't stop printing money, uh, and they had the ability to do it. Uh, so that's it. So Bitcoin is going to scale uh, with Lightning, uh, <laughs> Bitcoin is a store of value. Uh, it has been for me, certainly, and for many people that actually understand Bitcoin. And uh, maybe one day, hopefully, so, sooner than later, Bitcoin will eventually be like a unit of account. But I agree with you, Professor, 100% that... <laughs> no, there's only one professor on the panel here. Uh, I agree with you, Professor, that um, everything other than Bitcoin is an outright nonsense, and it is a barter system of the Stone Age if you are going to have a Coca-Cola coin, the Pepsi coin, or anything else that includes Ethereum and Litecoin and anything else. So Tone has this idea that you can't seize Bitcoin, which next year you'll see is completely wrong, uh, and a whole lot of people will be really, really annoyed, but too bad. And he has this totally idea, uh, wrong idea about Lightning, Scaling. The whole idea of Lightning was to not have records. Under MLD5, which is gold-plated here in um, the UK, there's a requirement to save every transaction. So when you're doing this, a uh, Lightning node is a money handler. Don't care whether you like it or not, government's already said it is. That means if you're running a, a Lightning node, you actually have to maintain every record for every node connected to you. You end up with a factorial growth of the amount of logs compared to Bitcoin. You end up with a six month log period that you're required as an individual by law to keep or you have committed a criminal offense and you have evidence of an offense. This is what Bitcoin does. You have signed transactions showing where money goes. So he's got this system that doesn't really scale, that has security vulnerabilities and basically shits all over Bitcoin that 
He says can scale because every person is going to have petabytes of information at home. Yay! Wow, that is the... That, that is total nonsense, but I just want to mention uh, that... No, no, see, I only talk to people like... Uh, I'm talking with people in the Law Commission. They wouldn't have any idea about law. I mean, I'm doing my Doctor of Law at the moment. Of course. And, and none of the professors how many have other, any how many, idea how many of law. How you working on right now? Two, uh, actually. Perfect. Um, uh, so, um, can Bitcoin uh, be confiscated one day? Can, uh, can the Bitcoin blockchain break? It's possible. The thing is, it's no, very, no, very break. unlikely. There's um, no break here. The, the Record is, allocation doesn't mean um, breaking. The, the question is, it's very unlikely. Like, how safe is your Bitcoin in your cold storage? Uh, if it's you're pretty committed safe. a crime, and, um, seized. It's pretty safe. Um, but is the Bitcoin blockchain perfect? Could there be uh, something that completely breaks it? Sure. What you have to realize is anything else in the crypto space is infinitely more okay. insecure. If so if you think your Bitcoin here, is going to be again, confiscated, we, we, I, I can feel we're just like going down the slope on of, the of the SV chain. crypto inside squabbles, really, because we have to be as generic as, as possible here. And my question, I'm just bringing you down on the right track here, really. Uh, it's identifying these flaws that are today, uh, that can see today in the modern centralized financial system. Okay. What, sorry, what does that mean? Centralized financial system. The Fed is 13 central entities. Banks. Well, how, there are over 100 central banks. Yeah. Do there are over 15,000 banks. You're, uh, there are over 100 currencies. You're talking centralized. Centralized what? What do you mean by centralized? Do you mean when you have the ability to pay in 1,000 different methodologies that's centralized, where you have companies enabling um, you to transact in over 50,000 different methods? To me, centralized, centralized means just being in control of all the transactions, first and foremost, okay? That's the thing that's that what. he's trying but, to build. <clears throat> so, where you, well, wrong, but. Where you're talking about that, you're talking about um, in control. The central bank doesn't control where notes go. The central bank doesn't Would you agree with that, Professor Rubini? I agree that actually what you refer to as a centralized uh, financial system is not centralized. There are thousands and thousands of financial institutions. There are lots of means of payments. There are lots of different currencies. There are lots of central banks. Um, so... It's a system in which there is a significant amount of competition. There is all this fintech revolution. So people say it's terrible, it's a centralized system, but I'm not sure, honestly, what it means. And the alternative is not a financial system, it's not even a currency, and it's not even decentralized because everything in the crypto world is centralized. So oh, we're talking about an artificial comparison with something like a boogaboo of centralized financial system, fiat money. I mean, you speak about fiat money, uh, central banks have reacted to financial crisis by doing quantitative easing, credit easing, zero policy rate, negative policy rate to avoid deflation. We don't have an inflationary problem today. If there's inflation, there's inflation among shit coins. Every other day there is a shit coin created out of fiat. The supply can be endless. Thousands of them. The average one has lost 99% of its value. Thousands of them. Uh, that, that's uh, fiat money, right? That's a uh, crap see, that's created uh, you every that? other day. No, for fiat that's, money, that's a my earlier is, uh, question was just, about you know, printing. It's not to do with decentralization. So let me ask just you, my earlier question regarding Max's no question about a problem not used by anybody. System. I'll just talk over and him. Pretending you're over creating me. a different so financial system. Go so one by November next month, I mean. All right, so Professor, the question about money printing, what do you think of that? I'd like to hear your comment on that. Fiat money printing. Is it a there, good thing or a bad is, thing? There is nothing wrong with quantitative easing. There is nothing wrong with zero policy rates. There is nothing wrong with negative policy rates. There is nothing wrong with forward guidance. There is nothing wrong with anything the central banks are doing because today we have a problem of lack of aggregate demand. There is a global savings glut. There is secular stagnation. And if during the global financial crisis, we had made the same mistake was done in the 1930s of letting everybody liquidate, of no monetary easing, no fiscal easing, of backstopping the financial system, we then end up with the Great Recession becoming Great Depression 2.0. This so recovery I, has not been great, I have but we learned bill. the lessons of the past where there was no monetary policy. Let me we ask have you central this. banks, Let me ask you we have a lender of last resort, and that saved the lender system. Of last resort. That's You're why the, last the system resort. has worked. Okay, it okay. has worked. So it has worked by your definition. But for me, this money, not this physical one, but I moved to the United States in 1989, 30 years ago, 
And I remember $100, it had a small Benjamin Franklin head. Some of you have seen that. It was worth so much money. It could do so much for me over a weekend, pay for lunch, pay for dinner. Inflation My question for you is, over is 30 years, zero. I had the same bill. I hold it for 30 years. Is it fair, is it good that today this piece of paper is worth much less than it was 30 years ago? Is that fair? It's fair, it's just really? It's one of the laws Listen, of finance. A, a, any shit coin in a matter of 24 oh, months shit coin? has lost, has lost not, I don't 99 percent, 99 percent of its but, value. But that's okay? like eating Zimbabwe dollars is, has lost 100 no, percent value. There is no inflation in the U.S. Compare. There is no inflation in Europe. Sir. There is no Hold inflation on a in the U.S. I am not using a shit coin here. Do you call this a shit coin? No, that's not the shit coin. Then I don't, that's compa a I don't so compare that's a Zimbabwe dollars with your money, okay? Don't bring up shitcoin if I don't bring up Zimbabwe it's dollars. Fiat currencies so are perfectly fine. Really? They're perfectly really? fine. Hold on a second, sir. Compared to your Hold system of shitcoin, I, I don't, they're hey, 100% wait a minute. fine. I don't support shitcoins. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> you, support, you support shit there fiat. There is nothing wrong with the it's US It's like me dollar. saying you support Sorry. shit fiat. It's a are you behind account. Zimbabwe it's dollars? It's a means of payment. Are you behind it's the Argentina peso? Are you behind the Venezuela bolivar? Are you behind Indian rupee? There are there are 200 currencies in the world. Two or three of them are there are failing. thousands Most of, of them shit coins. Are fine. I don't care about the shit coins. I'm talking about the US of D. US of A, the US dollar. E everybody wants the US dollar. No one wants Let the me shit ask coins. You, That's for the, the US dollar, this say. US dollar, 30 years ago, it was worth a lot to me, and the same piece of paper is worth a lot less to me today. Is that cool? Inflation is less than two percent. Is that cool? Is, uh, is if less you left it in the bank, three percent. Okay. Less than one percent. There are plenty of ways you can add. There are plenty of ways you can add yourself against inflation. That, that is that is not acceptable. Okay, your answer is not acceptable. You're avoiding the topic. You're avoiding the question. My question there is simply: for the U.S. Of, dollar. There are thousands of shit coins that have been debased overnight within not a hundred years. I'm not asking about shit coins. Months, it's like me okay? asking about the so, shit, the dog so the question, in, your, what's in your I'd garden. Your, I'll take what? your hundred dollar bill against any shit coin you want to give me. We're not talking about shit coins here. We are. I'm talking about the shit in your toilet. What? Your shit in your toilet stinks. It smells. Well, are we talking uh, about that? Uh, this is where we're not talking about that. This we're is talking where about the U.S. dollar fiat money, the king of fiat money, the U.S. dollar, against loves Bitcoin. Everybody loves it. I, 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 I love I, it. That's I why unfortunately, I have it. But my question is, I have to agree with Noriel on most of this. You know, just like in 1999, 99 percent of the internet startups failed, and probably. 90 to 99 percent of the crypto projects are also going to fail, and most of them are shit coins. Though we did get eBay, we did get Amazon, things did come out of the internet that still benefit us today. You know, the one area where we differ is I do believe that the work that we're doing here is going to deliver long term positive implications. Where I disagree with many is I don't know where that innovation is going to come from. All of these experiments are iterative tests. And if anyone succeeds in making the world a better place, we all win, which is why I encourage Craig Wright and everybody else to continue to innovate because we don't know where the answer is going to come from. And anyone that thinks they knows the answer today, very well could be wrong. Lovely. All right, I, 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 I want to comment on that last part later, but I want to add something to what Bobby was saying. Um, let's be happy that there is at least one paper currency in the world where a 30-year-old bill can still be worth something because I don't think anyone can hold up a paper bill from any other country from 30 years ago and it having any value at all because every country has canceled their paper currency completely um, in the pounds. last 30 years. So think about we that have pounds. and eventually and the, the, oh, the reason why the US, well your paper pounds from 30 years ago well, still, I, if I, still if worth I, I, I think my pound coins don't work anymore, all to, my old you have pound to turn coins, them in my for sterling plastic coins ones. are no longer in circulation. Uh, they're canceling. I've got hundreds of pounds. Are talking about there, there are five pound notes that they're have canceled. been canceled. Absolutely. And they're still valid, they're canceled. you can still redeem they're them. They're all going to be canceled because, <laughs> so, because the government wants you to turn in your money because of by surveillance. By the way, the 30-year-old uh, US Bitcoin. dollar isn't the same as the current one. But so it's still, the argument but paper. It's still working. But it's still working at least. Right? So are 30 year old pounds. So I can still take them to the bank and deposit them. Hello, hello. So that's just bullshit. I mean, it's it's more tone based bullshit. If your if your if your grandfather hit a suitcase of cash fifty years ago and you found it, 
it's worth nothing. Nothing. Do you realize no, you won't? They've been you canceled. can take it to the bank. They've he likes canceled. to lie. You can take it to the bank and they give you new notes. No. Oh no. I get a fifty pound okay. note for my Buy fifty Italian pound note. Lira. Oh, if I find it's plastic. a suitcase of Italian lira. A bank will take it and give me euros for it. No, go but give it a try. Will. <laughs> go give it a try. Gents, we have another two or three minutes to go. Unfortunately, we'd love to continue this for, for hours <laughs> and hours. No, it's so question. entertaining. So, uh, who, who, who understands the C, uh, ECB? Yes, please. Uh, the European Central yes. Bank. Yes. Why, why do they have a zero dollar note from the ECB? Explain this to me, Professor. Yeah, what the hell have is you that? Seen this? What the hell is that? What is that? You're making fiat money. What, what, what the hell is that? <laughs> huh? You have, you, have, you, have shiat, you have shit fiat that has zero on it right there. <laughs> is that what you endorse? That sounds like BSV. Could we possibly ask the audience to come up with questions, please? Okay, you were the first. Going over, coming over here. ECB. Say your name and the question. Short, short. Uh, Great uh, question. Is, thank you. No, yeah. no pressure. Uh, my, my name is uh, Julio Alejandro. Um, why don't you refuse to answer most of the questions? I just think that it makes you look bad. I'm, I'm talking to the Soto professor. I'm also a professor. Thank you. That will have to be for professor. We're not going to get a different answer, so let's ask another Anybody pass the mic? I don't think he's refusing to answer. Tone, pass the mic. I if somebody think other questions. people are shouting him down. He's okay. not getting a chance to. Uh, Anyone else? Another question? I, I have a question. No, uh, he's being shouted down. I have a question down. for Craig. All right, go mm -hmm. on. Uh, the name Satoshi Nakamoto, where does it come from? No, no, uh, please, can I interfere, Star? I'll step <laughs> in here. Okay. None of that. He wants that for tomorrow. We have a very intense program for the rest of the day and tomorrow. I mean, it's really crammed with, with, with important personalities. Please, let's keep it uh, low here, okay? Question here. One question from the audience, and we're rounding off this one. Say who you are. Yeah. Toby Lewis, uh, Nova Insights. I was just wondering, where does this all play out? What, what currencies are going to be important? Very short, sharp from each of the panelists. Who would you ask the question to? The, so, please? well, I was, I was intrigued to get. But not all five, five, please. Just but pick to up one. Rubini and Tone Bays. Okay, we'll start with Professor, please. <coughs> well, we're still in a world in which the US is the major reserve currency. 60% of all reserves are dollars. There's a euro, there's a pound, uh, there's a Japanese yen, and the RMB may become a major reserve currency. Um, you know, we are in a world of digital money, as I pointed out. Uh, no, what there are all these alternative payment systems that are quite cheap and efficient. They're going to be complementing what's happening. I honestly uh, don't believe in a world in which you're going to have uh, dozens or hundreds of cryptocurrencies competing with uh, fiat money. As no. I said, that's a world of, of barter. Most of them are failing. You know, maybe Bitcoin is a partial store of value, but it's not a unit account. It's not a means of payment. It's not, it's not, it's not scalable. You know, even Bitcoin has lost, in spite of his rally this year, 60% from his peak. So I don't see it going anywhere, frankly. So we live in a world in which there'll be a huge amount of financial innovation. The US dollar has lost 97% since gonna, 1930. Yeah, 100 years ago. Whoa, oh, whoa, well, what about... Well, well, the typical... Wait, what's wrong with the 100 the, the years? Typical, what's wrong with the 100 the years? The typical, Why shouldn't the money be worth more than the 100 years? Has lost wait, hold on a second. Oh, wait, I'm not talking about shit coins. In 12 months. I'm not talking about the shit coins. In 12 months, not in 100 years, okay? I'm not in talking about shit coins. I'm talking about the US so dollar US has dollar, lost 97% right? of its value. In 100 in, years, okay? You're, you're, saying, you're, saying, you're saying by money okay. definition, so it should be less than 100 years. Job. I'll take the dollar for any one of your shit coins any point in time. Now, guys, uh, guys, guys I have to take the, the mics from you now because we'll have to stop it, Bitcoin unfortunately. Oh, okay. Tone, one uh, last uh, final uh, 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 so, um, statement on this. Uh, so you asked about currencies. I think uh, in the next 10 to 20 years, the US dollar is still going to be king and important. I think all the other fiat currencies are going to depreciate against the US dollar as long as it keeps, you know, the... Politi uh, somewhat stable political system and uh, doesn't cancel its currency like every other country has. And other than that, it's Bitcoin. Uh, and Bitcoin will outperform the U.S. dollar uh, by a lot. And there's only one Bitcoin. Okay, on, on this, what, on this, uh, on this note, we'll, we'll stop here. Just say mind. one quick thing. So what do you think? We can go on for ages here. I wish Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin up from the U.S. dollar in the next 20 and years. What he doesn't realize is out of the 826 patents we've already got filed, um, putting us more than China and IBM, one of those actually covers lightning, and it's been granted. So, 
So, so guys, would you please well, I had you on my round podcast off here. And you promised me you would destroy Roger Veer's Bcash, and you failed. So now you want me to believe that you will destroy oh. Bitcoin? He, he mic, seems please? to have a short time period. We're talking about someone who's uh, working on his fourth doctorate and thinks that, well, a year is sort of anything more than a blink. Great. I wish we could have another hour. <clears throat> no, 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 no. I, have to, I have to grab the mic from you. <laughs> Now, if you kindly allow me to, to, to round off the panel here, of course, we can go on for ages. Have you enjoyed the panel? Let's get a love, big round of applause. And that's what CT Forum is about. It's about bringing people with polar opposite opinions and, and getting them clashed, and hopefully in the hope that the quintessence of truth will be distilled.